I'm here with Josh Taylor, uh, stage name's Joshua Lee, a musician, a friend of mine. We met a couple years ago, I think, uh, working on a couple music video projects. Yeah, it's been a couple years. Yeah. And uh, it, all the time that we spent together, I think we were always either talking about uh, setting up a show for um, the, out the UUC or some project or something, and, and otherwise we've only had a couple minutes to talk in passing. and. I know that uh, you lived in Nashville. Yeah. And uh, so let, let's kind of start there because I've always been curious about that. Um, how long did you live in Nashville? Uh, I think it was about 13, 13 years. I went down right after high school and started college there. That would have been 99. Then we moved up here about three years ago. So whatever that math works out <laughs> to, I think it's roughly 13 years. Uh, did you know you wanted to play music when you went down to Nashville? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was the purpose. I did college. Uh, you know, you're taught to always do college, and the parents pushed a backup plan. Right. So did music business. and uh, But I, I actually, like, as quick as I could was trying to play, and I took a break for a while so I could try to focus on music. So really the, the, the game plan all along was to, to play music. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep, that was the purpose. Um, yeah, college was good. I mean, I learned a lot, and m much more importantly, I made a, a bunch of really good lifelong friends. So, um, yeah, I think that's uh, other than the the obvious uh, getting an education and a degree that the uh, the friends you make uh, in college and and to go from being a, a child to a young man and young mm -hmm. person. Um, for me, growing up around here, the the cultural differences of college uh, was great, and plus being exposed to all kinds of great music. And you were in Nashville, so yeah, uh, you must have saw incredible musicians. Sure, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was rough. I mean, it was amazing and rough at the same time. I mean, you you go you grow up in a small town, and you know you kind of it's the whole like big fish. Is that what it is? Big fish in a small pond. Right. Um, which I don't think I was ever even really a big fish, but then you throw me in into the the big pond of Nashville, and it's overwhelming and it's kind of embarrassing and extremely humbling. But but it's also really good. I mean, you you just can't help but pick up at least a few good habits. You know, you have to work hard not to. You right. know, so um, the, the, there's music absolutely everywhere. There's studios in just about every other house, it seems, and. Um, I mean, they say it's one of the biggest, like, um, what is it, like the, the most churches per capita in is any really? city in the United States, and every church seems to have at least one just unbelievable singer, you know, <laughs> if not if not a whole choir full, you know. Yeah. And, and I can imagine that uh, being in, in a city where it's really so much of it's about music and there's so many great musicians that you don't rest on your laurels and, and, and then you're inspired and... I'm sure uh, a crazy amount of opportunities exist down there if you're sure. work hard. Sure. Yeah, sure, sure. I tried not to do country music. Um, I mean, I went down trying to get into like the Christian music world because that's what I grew up in and that's what I knew Nashville for, you know, Christian and country music. But I was that kid that was like, I like all music but country. You yeah, know? right, right. So I, I tried to stay away from that, but ended up I just couldn't yeah you know sooner or later you find people that you really care about that are doing really good music and um it doesn't matter what it is and and then ultimately like you kind of were saying before we started like the money follows and at some point it's like I've got a real opportunity to to do country music with a guy that I really like yeah. with with and his writing is phenomenal and it was all of my best friends and you yeah. know that that is a big part of it. Uh, playing in a band, uh, if you really like the people you're with and and they're talented, it, the genre, yeah, it, it's not necessarily the most important thing. I, I think that's a lot to do with it. I mean, the the genre and even like, you know, I keep being reminded of this lesson, but like, you know, a lot of people think like you just go and you get the best players you can, and that's that's going to make a great band, but. 
it's really about people that you want to hang out with more than that. Right. Like I, I would gladly sacrifice, you know, a little bit of, of ability in, in a, a player if they're just a better hang. Right. <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly. You're going to, if you tour especially, because then you're going to be in a van for hours right. with this person. And, and just in general, the amount of time you spend practicing and, mm-hmm. and um, working on, if you're working towards a common goal, if you don't get along or you don't like the person, it's miserable. Yeah. And, and, um, and generally, I, I've even found, like, I, I've been in bands where I was the least talented guy, <laughs> but it, it made me get better. Yes. And, um, yeah. and, and that's the, the interaction between people. That's something that you really, if it starts off bad, it usually doesn't. So, right. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that makes all the difference. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's an easy thing to forget, but... Um, it really is, and and it's it's surprising how much you don't think about that being the case in a city like Nashville and in, in like the big music industry. But it really is like it's a driving force. There are a few exceptions, you know, the artist that's like, no, I will not settle on a guitar player, and they'll go through twenty guitar players in a year until they find the one who plays it just the way they want. But that's kind of the exception. It's like once you get into a certain uh, I guess get to a certain level of proficiency of being able to play. It really is like they're choosing between this guy who can play just as well as that guy within, you know, Everybody's a good. few degrees. Yeah. It's all about like, who do we want to spend time with? Who sure. do we want to hang out with? You know, um, it's, it's, uh, it, it really is, uh, I think, uh, an intimate relationship, relationship, uh, being in a, in a band with people, <laughs> um, not uh, sexually maybe, but right. definitely, um, <laughs> I know that I, one time I was at a party with the guys I was in the band with, and we sat around a circle talking, and people kept saying, uh, are you going to come join the party? And we're like, yeah, in a minute. And then the next thing we knew, the party was over. Right. And we didn't <laughs> care. We, it, uh, yeah. it, it, those are your people, and yeah. you, you become very close with them. Yeah. Yeah, you do, uh, and especially when you're spending time in a band. Yeah. And I, I did a band where we, the, the lead singer was based in L.A., and we the whole band, well, all the band except for one guy lived in Nashville. So we would... I think four or five times we made the drive in the van from Nashville to LA straight through. I think it was like 35 hours. If I remember (laughs) right, no hotels, just trading, trading drivers. You go completely crazy and you, you get to know people in a totally different way. Um, (laughs) yeah, if there was any uh, tension, it's going to come out. Oh, and it did. (laughs) (laughs) It did. (laughs) It did for sure. Those are, uh, I, I think, uh, playing music and being in the band. Those experiences like that, aside from them playing the music, are part of what why people love it. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, when I when I was moving, sat around like kind of the last night after I'd packed up the house and uh, sat around with a couple of those guys that were my best friends, and in, one in particular that was in a couple of these, these bands with me just remembering stories and just, I mean, you can rehash old stories for hours, you know, and it's, you know, things that you'll never forget or some things that you'll gladly forget. (laughs) But, and and it's, uh, you're having life experiences that most people don't have. Yeah. And, uh, and then at the end of all the hard work, you get to go on stage and perform in front of people, which is uh, (laughs) a unique feeling in itself. It is. It is, yeah, and and sometimes once you've been touring a lot, you find that that's, and that's kind of part of the reason I I got off the road. I mean, you find you spend all of this time on the road, in a van or a bus, and you know at at a certain point there's just absolutely boredom. That's right, and then at best you get to play for maybe an hour, right, and sometimes yeah. you've driven eight hours, right to go sit around for three or four more hours and then play an hour and then drive eight hours back or, right. you know, it's just that, that part of the road is brutal, you know? And, and some of the bigger tours that I was on, I mean, we got a 25 minute set, yeah, you know, so you're going, and those were some of the longest hauls, you know, and those yeah. were bus tours and it was like, you'd do a 10 hour haul and get a 25 minute set <laughs> and just 
sit around and <laughs> uh, so uh so what kind of uh accent did you uh, get to perform with uh well in that kind of those last few years that i was playing i was playing with a uh, country artist named randy montana um who's a phenomenal songwriter it's in his blood his dad's a really great and uh, accomplished songwriter too and uh he's somebody i went to college with and just knew kind of as an acquaintance through another friend who I was very good friends with. Um, and he he really loved a band that me and my friend played in and would come and see us and was like, you know, um, I'd like to have you guys play in the band. So it kind of happened right as he got his, his first deal. Perfect. And so we we kind of, uh, it just it just fell into place. It was me and two of my very best friends and then, some other guys that I became really close to in time. But um, through that, it's like we did that van van tour and all over playing these ridiculous little country clubs, like in strip malls and things. And, right. But uh, that led through the, you know, through his deal, there were all kind of opportunities. We got to do a tour with uh, Little Big Town and Sugarland. That was a lot of fun. That was our first, like, kind of big bus tour. Played, uh, you know, amphitheaters and arenas and things. Um, got to do a theater tour with Little Big Town, just the two of us, just the two acts after that. And then later we did um, we did a very short, like, 15-minute acoustic set on a uh, leg of uh, Taylor Swift tour, which was wow, shocking. <laughs> <laughs> shocking to see that thing in action. I mean, that was arenas, you know, football yeah. stadiums and things. That's and incredible. It was... Uh, it was something. <laughs> it was something. Now, uh, playing in front of a big crowd like that, did you find it uh, more scary, or was the the mass of people so big that that you kind of couldn't take it in? No, it's definitely for me. It's definitely less scary. It's um, yeah. You, it's so easy to kind of just the everybody just becomes kind of one mass, you know. And it's almost so surreal. It's like you're watching on TV anyway, yeah. you know. It's much more intimidating to play to ten people in a tiny little coffee shop kind of a thing, you know. You... Especially if one of those people is a girl that you're trying to date. You know, <laughs> you're, you're really uh, nervous. Yeah, well, <laughs> that'll do it. <laughs> do, do you remember the, the the first time that you were on stage or that you performed where um, it kind of clicked in and, and you realized that this is something that I want to keep doing? Man, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is not me on stage, but a show I watched when I was, like, probably, oh, boy, I can't remember exactly, maybe a freshman in high school. I was a freshman or sophomore. And it was this uh, this Christian rock band called Audio Adrenaline that was just one of my heroes. And my dad took me and some friends, like, an hour drive to go see him at this church that actually I had grown up going to before we'd moved. And... uh there was just something about, I don't know what it was. It was just in the air that night, you know. I was like, that's that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. There, there was something electric that happened. And then, um, it, there's just not, I don't know. There's not a way to explain that sort of thing. You so know? how long after that did you actually get a chance to, were you already I was already kind of playing a little bit. Yeah, yeah. My parents are both um, music teachers. My dad teaches band and orchestra at junior high level. Mom teaches elementary music. So, I mean, I was playing piano from a very young age. I don't remember when I officially started lessons, but, I mean, practically as long as I can remember, I've at least been toying around with the piano, you know. Started guitar in high school. Started, I played horn, French horn, in junior high. So my dad was yeah. the director, so he had to. Right, right. <laughs> he just had to. And so, I mean, I did... I was doing music for quite a while already. Um, yeah, I, I can't recall the first time playing on a stage. I'm sure it was in a church function of some kind, probably just, uh, but but I just can't remember. Were you probably pretty young then? <laughs> uh, well, I guess for like rock music, it would have been high school, you know, because I, di I didn't pick up guitar till high school. My, my parents had some tape of me singing a song, like a very short little thing on stage at our church when I was like three or four. <laughs> and they always told me, and I, I actually heard the cassette when I was a little older. I think 
you know, I sang the thing because the pastor would hear me sing this little, this little short thing, and I guess he thought it was cute. So he made me come up in front of the, the whole congregation. And in my memory, it was like thousands of people. I'm sure it was right. only a couple hundred at most. It was a big church, but uh, everybody laughed when it was done. I think probably because they thought it was cute. Yeah, yeah. Like you do. Like I laugh at my kids now, and I just thought they were making fun of me. So uh, I was like, I do not want to play in front of people. <laughs> but somehow I got over it, I guess. So when you were in high school, uh, you had a rock band. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was like me and a couple of friends. That's how we all learned to play. You know. Yeah. It's like, well, play this guitar, and I want to want to see if I can learn how to play it. So, how about you play bass and you play drums and. So, you, you know, just start doing it. There's something uh, nice about the simplicity of those days because you don't really even realize what you're kind of doing or <laughs> right. what you're getting into. And, yeah. and um, when, when you realize that you're actually making music with other people, that is kind of a, they're just they're excited. Oh, we're doing this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do remember the first practice. Uh, it was at my house in the living room. And I remember uh, one of my best friends who was going to play bass, his parents brought him over. I don't remember where he'd gotten the bass. Who knows? Doesn't matter. I had an acoustic guitar. I don't think we had drums. I think we had a girl that I, like, was my girlfriend, quote unquote. And uh, I think she came over and played piano. I think she lasted one practice. And then it was me and, and the bass player. And then we found some other people. Nice. But um, I do remember that. But some of those memories don't stick too well. Right. <laughs> so, um, how did you, uh, your wife's from here? Yeah. And this is actually mm -hmm. her father. We're in your recording studio here at the church, uh -huh. and your father-in-law is the pastor. He right? is. Yes. Yeah. And and we were actually married in this church before he was the pastor, which is kind of strange. It's a strange thing. Where, where are you from? I I grew up in Northwest Indiana. Okay. Like. Um, was born in Valparaiso, so it's like just kind of out of Chicago. It's kind of part of Chicago land by extension. Oh, okay. And then you met Sarah. Well, <laughs> that's a story, I guess. Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so my dad's from here too. Oh, okay. My dad grew up, was born and raised in Warwood. Oh, okay. So he, um, let's see if I can get this story right. He he has a twin brother who went to West Liberty. My dad, when, when college started, moved away towards, towards Chicago for college, and he never moved back. But my dad's twin brother wound up becoming really close with Sarah's dad at West Lib. I see. And he ended up uh, being part of starting this little private Christian school up, up in that part of northwest Indiana, where, we've, where, where, where I grew up. This was before I was born. So my uncle kind of helped start the school, and hired my parents and Sarah's parents to come like teach and be oh, a part wow. of that. And in that, my uncle wasn't yet married, so my, my, as I understand it, my parents and her parents spent a lot of time together because they were both married couples. Right. Kids started happening, her parents moved back, and we just, they continued a friendship and we did family vacations together. I mean, we would come here, like earliest memories, I have early, early memories, because my dad still had some family here and so we'd go hang out with them with the, since they had some kids. And right. then they would come out there. And sometimes we'd meet in other places. I, I, I think we might have done a family joint family, family vacation at Kings Island when we were kids, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I've known her my whole life. Like, That's really cool. We didn't grow up in the same town, but we've known each other as long as we can remember. And uh, so when I was on the road post-college playing music, started like inviting her to the shows sometimes because she was doing med school so she'd be in cleveland sometimes we'd do a show columbus sometimes i think she caught a show in pittsburgh and just kind of kind of grew out of uh talking on the phone and all that and that's awesome yeah yeah and now you have how many kids i have three three boys good for you how old are they <laughs> uh let's see we've got one that just turned one a few months ago uh three and five and a half so they are <laughs> Out of control. Yeah, yeah. Out of control. That's a handful. It really is. It really is. I can imagine uh, uh, sometimes uh, some, at some point in your house, it's like a zoo. <laughs> <laughs> that's pu that's putting it lightly. <laughs> that's putting it lightly. They um, And right now, since we're living with our in-laws, they're being kind enough to l let us uh, crash with them for an extended period while we're getting a renovation. So 
that is really insane right now. <laughs> we are all crammed into a house that was not meant to have all of those people and all of those kids, and uh, it gets nuts. And their their cousins live right next door, so they come over, and then it's oh just and their boys, two yeah. two twin boys that are a week younger than our oldest. So it's just five little boys running around. The holy house. moly. It's insane. Well, I see why it's nice to have a studio up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no way you can record. Uh, our one-year-old would, his favorite thing is just to ruin anything that you're doing. <laughs> so, like, I'll, pl I'll plug my hard drive in over there, and he's definitely unplugged it <laughs> in the middle of, of trying to do oh, editing. No. no. <laughs> I might have lost everything. No. Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, it's it's a madhouse, but uh, it's fun, and they are uh, they're incredible. <laughs> um, so, because uh, because uh, it just seems to like I remember that uh, at one point Josh was just in town, and 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 um, and it was great because as soon as you got in town, you became very active. And did you know Michael? Because I met you through Michael right. and Freight and. Um, did you kind of already know some musicians here? I did not. I did not. And actually, for for the first year, um, to be honest, I tried not to play music at all, and I, I kind of didn't. I was really burnt out, kind of um, just the whole road, being on the road, and kind of the way things developed at the end of that. I was I was ready to be done, and that was part of what you know kind of freed us up to move. She got the job offer and everything, or or started looking. But I, I just I wanted a way to get off the road. Yeah. Once once we started having kids, I mean that tour. It kind of started with that Taylor Swift tour. So my oldest Max, Sarah was very pregnant, and we had a tough choice. Like, should I do this tour? Because you never know. Right. And sure enough, we had two shows left on the tour. Um, I think we were in Rhode Island or something, and we were heading to to play. Um, Gillette Stadium, two nights at Gillette, the Patriots football stadium. Wow. And she calls and she's like, uh, this is going to happen. <laughs> so I had to catch a flight and miss the last two shows, and I'll never let Max forget that. <laughs> <laughs> but that was kind of the start, and then we still had some other tours, some other big big tours, and then just small van tours, and it just being gone all the time was like, yeah. I was just anxious, and it was very hard. She She was working a full job and a long commute and so that it was like max was with a babysitter for most of his life it felt like right and um and you come home from the road and it's like a, at least a day to kind of recover from the weird schedule and then get back to your sorts and then you you know then you're gone again right so i was burnt out and i was kind of tired and tired of music so i got here and i was like i'm just I'm done. Yeah. You know, I'm going to try to, I thought about trying to start a, a restaurant or a brewery and kind of looked into all those things. We looked into buying a building downtown. I tried to think of any other thing that I could do. But music. But music. Right. And I literally just did not play for like a year. And then something happened. Like, um, it kind of kind of went through a dark phase after our second kind of trying to adjust to not having all my friends around and you know just everything being different you right. know and just writing just started happening you know it just started happening again and I, I kind of couldn't help it so that got me into looking around and I had a hard time finding musicians at first sure. I did like the first the, first of all I didn't know where to go right um in Nashville it's like well, just pick a bar and go there, and <laughs> right. if there's music, you're going to find some people. Right, you know, right, that's exactly. it. That's all there is to it. Or, if, or pick a church for that matter, and you know, if it's of a big enough size, go to that church. They're going to have great music. You're going to meet some musicians. You know, sure. here it wasn't so obvious. You know, and that was that was the the first kind of the first kind of thing was like, where do you go? There's I don't know of a place. And I saw down on Main existed, but I didn't really didn't know if the jam scene was really my thing right right and that was my impression of it from from what i saw online but i did find videos of third friday nice. and through that i found ezra and i found mike and i saw you know um i'm pretty sure i saw concrete tp and stellar winds and 
um, brown bear. Brown, yeah. Um, and and what was it called? Hello Mingo. Is that what it was Hello called Mingo, before that? Yes, you yeah. know. And I was like, oh, okay. This, this is <laughs> this these is are my people, this yeah. is what I'm looking yeah. for. Yeah. And and so I happened to to keep searching around and found that Mike was playing a show at Smart Center one one night. And Sarah and I went down and I introduced myself rather awkwardly, as I do. <laughs> and uh, and that's kind of where it started. I I just I was like, that's the guy. He's doing kind of like this folky thing that I really like and he's very interested in theology which I find incredibly interesting and uh, that was where it started um, he was all I knew for a long time you right. know I don't I don't remember how it kind of unpacked from that just playing shows with him I guess and then through the blue church I suppose yeah. was was meeting was how I met other people and third Fridays um, Third Fridays was kind of the big thing. Yeah. Well, that was the thing that I maybe. So, uh, a lot of the people that I know, uh, either I met them at Third Fridays, or um, if I met them somewhere else, I got to know them a lot better right. at Third Fridays, and it's still one of my favorite things. Yeah. Uh, because that's sometimes the only time I see exactly. a lot of people that I really enjoy exactly at running into, and it's um, so, and that that brings me to a couple points. Um, Bridge and Tunnel Collective. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You're one of the founders of that, along with Mike mm -hmm. and and Sean and Sean mm -hmm. and Matt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, as you were saying earlier, that, that it was hard to find what was going on with music, and um, I think that's great because that really addresses that issue directly. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's definitely brought a lot more attention to the bands and, mm -hmm. and to the musicians. Right. Um, and then you guys were able to resurrect uh, Third Fridays and keep it going. Right. And and um, I, I, I couldn't be happier for that. I think that uh, the music scene really needed that, mm -hmm. and um, and especially it would, it would have been a shame to to see Third Fridays end because it is uh, such a, a great thing yeah. for music and just for the, the community of people to be able to get together. Right. Um, so, uh, how did that all, all come together to, to to do the the bridge and tunnel and Well. I think the I think the first sort of um, the first sort of step might have been this outdoor show at Generations a few summers ago. I didn't play because I wasn't I hadn't really developed my solo thing yet. I was playing with Mike. I was backing him up on guitar and, and vocals and probably mandolin a little bit or something. And I, I can't remember. There were two different shows, so I don't remember which one it was. But it was a show in which the Pussyfooters were there. Um, pretty sure Old Northern was there. Stellar Winds. It was like a lot of the Bridge and Tunnel people. Brown Bear played too. But somehow I got to talk in, as I recall, it was, um, let's see, Mike, Michael and Sean probably. Because it, actually it might have been Mr. Fancy Pants' first show okay. now, that I, now that I'm thinking about it. So I was talking to a couple of these guys who were all dads in mid-30s yeah. and were like, it, it talking about this problem of 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 having trouble not like there's not a place yeah. you know that that lack of a place to go right. you can kind of find it online if you know where to look but there just isn't a place and that's where it kind of started like that's what i knew from nashville i had a place yeah. you know for me it was the five spot in east nashville that's where i would go and i would meet all kinds of artists you know you don't just meet musicians but you like the graphic artists are there, the photographers are there, you know, all types, the videographers are hanging out there, you right. know, it's like, that's where you meet your people, producers, engineers, whatever you need, that's, they're all there, they're there yeah. you know, and so that's, I think that's kind of where it started, was in a con some kind of conversation there of like, we need a place, we need a thing, you know, and uh, it just sort of, it took time, you know, months and months of just letting it sit and thinking about it and trying to find places to play shows. And I think a lot of it after that was discussions that I had with Michael. And it was just kind of out of that, born out of that problem of we don't have a place, we don't know how to meet people, we don't have a place to play all the time, you right. know. Um, the couple of places that exist that are sort of small or mid-sized venues either aren't very friendly to original music or they're more for like radio country or they are kind of just booked up with other kinds of things right. and not interested in expanding. So 
I don't know. It's just sort of a one thing led to another. A lot of discussions about the problem. We talked about, well, do we, should we try to start a venue? You know, we looked at these different kind of collective things and these nonprofit ways. And we actually thought for a while about and, and, and talked to some people about maybe we find a building. Right. You know, maybe we do that. It just didn't make sense from a financial standpoint or a, or a time standpoint sure. for any of us to, I mean, we're talking about starting a venue, you're going to work a full-time job yeah, plus, right, you know, right. and never see your families. So we basically just decided, well, we'll kind of shift this into a, a sort of a virtual meeting space, right. you know, a sort of, sort of a virtual venue. And it, it's taken some time to kind of develop, but it's starting to make some sense. We're starting to get calls from people now and, and messages like, hey, we hear you book shows, right. or hey, we want to put together a show and we need some bands. Right. You know, I've gotten several of those in the last week all of a sudden, almost more than we can handle right now. Um, you know, we've started to get a few people that are like, hey, I produce music, you know, and let your people know, yeah. you know. I think having that uh, point of contact where if people are just generally interested, mm -hmm. they can go to you guys and then it's, it's a hub where everybody right. can kind of come together. And, and right. that's important. And I think um, the idea of having uh, a, a group that's not necessarily tied down to a location. I know uh, in Dayton, they had a thing called the New Space Underground. Mm -hmm. And it was wherever they could run a space. Mm -hmm. And they pretty, it was punk rock shows. So yeah. they would, they would uh, the guy put it, it was a guy named Ken Gross. He put on all the shows. And, um, uh, but, but you knew because of that name, you knew what you were kind of getting. Right. And, um, so the location didn't matter. And it actually was kind of exciting because, uh, it, it wasn't as stale as maybe going to the, to the same place. Right. And, um, and what I like about Bridge and Town was a nice diverse group of people. Yeah. And, um, I think that the Valley definitely was needing, uh, something to, uh, a catalyst to build a music scene mm -hmm. and and it would have either either been a place to play which if there's a place to play you can start building an audience and then mm -hmm. people go to shows they think well maybe i'll start a band because now i have a place to yeah, play sure um and um but i think this for for our area being that there's still not enough bands probably to support a venue right um that that without having to be tied down to think that there's there's enough interest in local music and mm -hmm. they're attracting more and more fans. Yeah. Um, and the fact that, uh, the mains fans will come see concrete TP and, and mm -hmm. getting everybody together, mm -hmm. uh, that first show that you guys did at uh, third Fridays, there was so, so much excitement in here. I, right. I didn't see, I hadn't seen that many smiles on people's faces in yeah. a long time. Yeah. And, uh, man, everybody had a great set. We were talking about that on the last podcast with Mr. Fancy Pants mm -hmm. about what a great night that was for, for willing music it yeah. Was, yeah i'm looking forward to another one <laughs> yeah yeah but there's been some really good shows uh since then I'm yeah sure. so, yeah and and you know what's exciting too honestly this last third friday i loved what happened this last third friday i did too um i mean the, it just kind of first of all it showed that there are other people out there that that are working that are trying to to make some music and that are very talented it also gave an opportunity for some people like Weird Lightning, um, for like Ananka and Robert Martin, for like these kind of people who don't either haven't played yet and have kind of thought about it. You know what I mean? Right. Like this is what you're saying. Like Absolutely. you provide the opportunity, and that's been something that we've hoped to do from the beginning. We'd love to do that more for like even younger, like high school age kids, if we can find a way to pr present those opportunities too, just to encourage younger people. I mean, from an outsider coming into this area, it looks, it look when I when I look around, it looks like most of like a, a generation left uh, of musicians kind of left town. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Because most of these musicians are like thirty somethings and forty somethings. Right. There's a few like like Mange that are uh, an old northern that that are a little younger, but it seems like that younger generation. Of musicians and I keep meeting people that are like oh yeah my kid went to Nashville to play oh, bring them back yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know like we need that here or they went to Pittsburgh or New York or, or somewhere else you know uh, that's one thing we'd love to do is like show that you can have a scene here right you don't have to leave you know there's there's a lot here and if you want to tour from here it's great Pittsburgh's right here Columbus yeah. is right there Cleveland everything like everything is so close 
you know, we just need the space and we need the sort of maybe momentum. Right. You know. And, and, and I think that, that that you're on the right track. And that, that's one of those things that's like a, a, I, I don't know what I could, what metaphor I could use, but uh, it, it builds slowly. And, and, and I think that's the thing. You, you look back after a year or two and, and you realize how far you've come. And, yeah. Um, I, I've always thought that, that there are a lot of artists, whether they're painters or filmmakers or musicians, that toil away in obscurity at home and they don't really show their work to other people because mm -hmm. they, they just need that little boost. Yeah. And, and whether it's um, just, oh, a Third Friday show, that's something to work towards. Right. And uh, if, if they have an opportunity and maybe someone to, to take them under their wing and say, yeah, you know, you've been working on some songs, come play a show. Right. They get that first one under their belt and, and, and then that inspires them to go on. And uh, I've seen a lot of uh, really crappy bands mm -hmm. uh, turn out to be great bands yeah. just because they they took that step and, sure. and um, they had something to work for yeah yeah you got to start somewhere and uh, you know you you need to have those places to play to go and and be crappy yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's and, important to be embarrassed and, and it's important to to you it's i don't know how you can become great without being yeah. embarrassed once or twice first at yeah. least you yeah know? And, and the and and you probably know this uh, uh um i was talking uh, somehow concrete tv they always come up on on the podcast uh -huh. uh, those guys have been practicing a lot lately because they have a show coming up uh -huh. so i think that the idea that if you do have something coming up or even just the goal to play somewhere mm -hmm. uh, you get a lot more done and you put, yeah. put a lot more heart into it as opposed to just kind of doing it at home for fun right sure yeah absolutely yeah it gives you something tangible to work towards um now, yeah uh, as a solo art artist uh, mm -hmm. As you are now. Um, now, when you were in Nashville, did you do much solo work? No, none. <laughs> so this has been good for you because yeah. it, it, had you stayed in Nashville, maybe. It... Yeah, the 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 shift. I mean, I started when I first got to Nashville, and, and even before that, I was playing in bands. And in um, my band in high school, I was I was like the lead singer and primary writer, but it was absolutely a collaborative thing, and that was pretty much the way it worked. Like I would either be, you know. A guitar player in a band or the lead singer of a band but it was always always a band thing until I kind of started to make that shift to sideman and like playing country and stuff like that and at that point I would get calls and the thing that would keep me working was just being a backup guitarist sure. you know um, so no I never sat down and did like a solo project this is my thing I'm gonna just do it myself right. It happened out of necessity. Yeah. <laughs> it might not have happened if I had quickly found, you know, a bunch of players that I really connected with. You know, maybe it would have been a band again. But because I couldn't, it's like, well, I guess I have to just do this myself. Right. I have to play bass on my record and, yeah. like, you know, figure out everything else myself. So, um, yeah, this is this is really my first crack at really doing a solo thing. Because I, I, I think the first time maybe that I heard you play was uh, when I, we recorded in front of the Blue Church. Oh, yeah. And you were help, and we worked on that project together. Yeah. And um, I, I would have never guessed at that, that you were just, you know, at the beginning of, of, <laughs> of a solo career. Um, yeah. Um, you, seemed to, you seemed to have taken to it well. Um, yeah, I think so. I think... I don't know when when the switch happened. I really didn't like doing that at first. Um, just always felt more comfortable as a collaborator. And because that's the way I did it in the past, to be honest with you, I didn't pay attention enough. Um, I didn't really pay attention to... I, I played with great drummers, and so as right. long as they weren't doing something totally ridiculous, like I never had to right. really get into what exactly they were doing, you know? or bass players for that matter, you know. Never had to really get into the nitty gritty of what is what is it that is actually good and what isn't, you know, that was taken care of for me. Right. And it's especially what, in the studio, you know, like I just never asked questions and I should have, you know. When people are good, you, it's, it's they're almost so good that you don't notice the effort. Right, and, absolutely. And, uh, I actually told one of my actors, Corey, the other day that, that I did, it wasn't until a couple of days later that I realized that, 
how well he did the scene because I, I didn't have to say anything to him mm. the whole time. <laughs> and it just, but it just seemed so natural that of course that's how he would do it. Right. But no, he could have, it could have been a lot worse. So yeah. I, I can totally uh, get that. Yeah. So like when you do that, next time you say you have someone who, or, or even the same person, if they're just not getting that scene right, imagine if you had gotten lazy and that now you don't know how to say, articulate, you know, yeah, this is what the problem is, or yeah. this is the thing that you need to do better, right? Right. Yeah, so that that, that was the initial thing with, being, with doing things on my own. Just not knowing how to do all those other things. I can play the guitar. I can sing okay. You know, I can write a song. The playing of the bass, the, the drums, the, like, producing, and, and especially the... the the little details of recording and things like that, I just never paid attention to. Yeah. So that took some time, but I have, I, I'm also really picky. <laughs> so yeah. I guess it works out. <laughs> well, yeah, you, at least, uh, that way you're really the master of the ship and they're right. and, uh, the captain of the ship and, 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 um, nobody can mess it up, uh, necessarily. And, yeah. and, and, uh, um, and plus the, just the ability that, that, uh, you don't have to wait for anybody to schedules to, to right. work out together. Right. Now we were talking um, before we started recording that that you are, are kind of putting together a, a band for the mm -hmm. for a show that's coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, primarily it's for the CD release. The CP is I'm done recording it. It'll be my first EP. It is I, I think today the first song is being the guy starting mixing it today as we speak. Hopefully. Um, so I'm doing a joint CD release show with Mike Iafrate in okay. June. Um, and I really want it. I just prefer full band. I, sure. I like to have all the sounds covered. Playing acoustic is fine, but I just, that's what I like to hear, you know? So, uh, kind of trying to get a band ready for that. We've booked some other shows and starting really early, trying to make sure that sure. it's all all tightened up so yeah we're starting on that now we've uh we actually did one show with a form of this band just a couple weeks ago and it it went really well and kind of shuffled a few things i think it's going to be really good it's starting to sound starting to sound pretty good so so you kind of went full circle from uh, playing in bands and, mm -hmm. and 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 kind of being a, a supporting guitar player for the bands and and um now you're back to, to playing, getting a chance to play in a band, but now you get to play your songs right. that you wrote, and, and uh, it's kind of funny how, how life <laughs> yeah. takes you on that journey. That, yeah. uh, you, you, you end up uh, probably in a place that, uh, that you need to be all along, or that's a really good place. Yeah, and I mean, there's a lot that I learned going through that that is actually really important for what I'm trying to do now, yeah. you know, just kind of the way that I want to see, um, like a live show produced, you get some of those lessons being a side man in Nashville, sure. you know, um, or even just actual recording production, you know, some of those things, even like I said earlier, like even as willfully, like trying not to ask questions as I was being like, it's still hard not to pick up some good habits sure. when you're, when you're in Nashville. And so, you know, those those were important important times and, and important things for what I want to do, I guess, or what I am doing. It's a uh, yeah. It was almost like a, a musical education being in Nashville. Oh yeah, 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 so, absolutely. And and it seems like now um, you're getting to play music and mm -hmm. and be in a band and um, all the things about being on the road and and all those things that maybe weren't. Uh, um, took the fun out of music or made it, made it uh, less enjoyable. Mm -hmm. You kind of get, got rid of all that stuff. And yeah. You got to keep, keep the part that you really enjoy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What I'm, what I'm hoping, what I, I think is true and I'm hoping is true is that sort of the age we're in right now for music with the internet being what it is, there are a lot of opportunities now for, um, for smaller acts, for independent acts to, you know, make a little bit of an income without having to go tour right. for 200 days a year, right. you know, there are other ways to do that. There are other sources of income 
and you can still you don't have to go through the whole label game you know yeah i when i was younger i remember thinking that uh, the only way to really be a professional musician is somebody would have to sign you mm -hmm. to, to a record label yep. and then of course your hopes would be you'd be really rich and then if the label dropped you you'd go back to <laughs> painting fences or right whatever. <laughs> uh, but i don't i don't think it's that way anymore you can oh, very little <laughs> yeah yeah I, it, it had it had it, the, the whole diy music thing mm -hmm. was only just starting to happen right um when I was playing music, but I, I wasn't really aware enough to it. But now I look back and I'm like, yeah, you don't have to make like a million dollars a year playing music. Right. If you could make make a, just a, enough of a living to 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 get by on, and you're playing music for yeah. uh, for a living, um, I'd, I'd be willing to make less. Yeah. To to do that and and maybe do a little bit of recording here and there and promote a few shows and and what you find is some of these solo artists right now that that are doing things well that are independent, or not just solo artists, but bands for that matter, that are independent, in, in some cases are making better money than these bands signed to big deals. Because they, it's... It's their money. It's their money, yeah. You know, it, it's, they're, they're taking 100% of, of what they generate, and, yeah. you know, of course, then they pay the, their team, that, that whoever they, they have to hire a publicist, okay. and whatever. You're essentially b building your own little independent label around yourself when, over time, you know. In time, you'd hire a booking agent, you'd hire... Sure you know a publicist maybe or you'd hire distribution so that you know you pay those things out but the the amount that labels would take and then they'd own your masters yeah so you hear nightmares that are kind of the rule for these bands that had deals that even good relationships with labels but the deal's over now and they can't they can't even get the income from their records now that they're on spotify right There's they don't get that yeah you know, they have they have no, or if the label doesn't want to go through the work of putting it up, yeah, then they're just their hands are tied. Yeah, they don't own those masters; they can't do anything. You know, and uh, I think a lot of the bands they they ended up walking away from. You know, maybe they did one or two records, and they end up owing the, the label money because they <laughs> they give you the money up front, right. and then you pay for it. You're you're actually paying for everything. It's a loan from the yeah. record, yeah. the record label, and if it did have, have good sales, you could end up. At very least, not making anything. Yeah, I mean, m as I understood it, most of the deals were, you know, you don't have to pay that money back when your deal's over. You don't owe them money, but you may not make anything. You, you're not going to make anything until you recoup. Yeah. The, uh, there must be a cloud or something going over. Get a little interference. <laughs> <or something. laughs> Maybe it's our ghost. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Almost. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't usually edit, but that part will have to edit out. Okay. See what's going on there. Wow. Huh. There we go. Hmm. And we're back. <laughs> it, it is an experimental podcast, and, and I am, after all, an amateur. We had a little problem with uh, some interference from the electricity, so we switched the battery power. And uh, so, uh, before the snafu, there we were um, talking about the the uh, the music industry, right? And, and how much it's changed, and and uh, yeah, it is uh, the opportunity for people to. Um, do the DIY on their own. Mm -hmm. and, um, I think that, that it gives more of the power to the artist. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of what I'm hoping and it's, it's what I'm hearing, you know, from, from other people. Um, it looks like, you know, the big thing about the internet, if you can harness it the right way, there's bound to be, a thousand people in the whole world that will really love your music if you're decent. You know what I mean? That's that's uh, interesting that you said that number because I was thinking of uh, Bill Burr. I was listening mm -hmm. to him and he said you just need a thousand really good fans. Yeah. that'll Buy a T-shirt and buy buy every right. know, buy a CD when it comes out and and really come to the shows when, when you when you do play and mm -hmm. and um, um, and if you don't tour even just just the, that would support what you're doing. A thousand people. Yeah. And that's. That was the same number that he used. I think you're absolutely right. That's the one. I don't remember where that originated, but that's the one that gets passed around. I get that from um, 
Oh, what's his name? Probably stole that. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it, I think I first heard it from. Um, oh, now I'm totally blanking on his name. That guy that wrote the Four Hour Work Week. He does a podcast uh, too. Yeah. T- Tim Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss. Yes. I think I heard it from him first, but I don't think he originated it. I think it was somebody else who wrote a book, but. Who knows? Whatever. <laughs> that was kind of their their thesis, and I think it's true. I think it, it, it I think it makes sense. If you have a thousand people that really will support you and will buy the CDs or the T-shirts and will buy the tickets to the shows, you can make a middle class living. Yeah. You know, and that's that's all I, that's all I want. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that isn't that that's kind of the new uh, dream. Uh, I think of a lot of musicians is instead of being a rock star and yeah. you know having a multi-million dollar home just being able to do what you love and, exactly. and make a nice living yeah. and, and uh, I, I think I, as I get older I tend to think that, that um, when I was younger I, I wanted to be rich and famous and sure. I, I think God thank God that didn't happen I, I would have been miserable <laughs> uh, the, the, once you get enough money to where you're comfortable I think it, then you just start to get spoiled right. and, and, and too, yeah. many, too many other things are, are put in front of you that are distract you from family mm-hmm. and, and and the craft that you're doing yeah sure and um you look at like the the, the motley crew guys i remember they said once that tommy lee bought a house next to his a mansion you know a million dollar house and tore it down so that he had a place to park off his ferraris and, <laughs> and um that, that's not a normal way to live no and your brain can't be thinking normal if, if you're acting like that yeah so, um yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean that. That's, I money's funny like that. I mean, this is all stuff that everybody kind of knows. I mean, y- you kind of can't ever make enough to be satisfied. Right. You know, once you start chasing that, chasing that thing, it's like there's just, you know, it's like okay, we'll buy a bigger house. Well, then I guess I need to buy more stuff to fill the right. fill the house. You know, and oh no, now I've got too much stuff for this house. I need a bigger house right. again. You know, and where does it end? It doesn't. It's just, it's just you never ever happy and never fulfilled that way. I'm a, a firm believer that uh, uh, as long as you live within your means, mm-hmm. um, you, you can and you can and, and you can usually figure that out. Um, then you don't really have any money stress. It's sure, living above your means, which is kind of. American way for a mm-hmm. lot of people um, that gets them into trouble because they are just as broke making sixty thousand dollars a year as they were when they made forty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. Um, so I kind of embrace that uh, uh, pretty frugally and um, uh, but but uh, not chasing that the financial rewards right. of different things and um, yeah yeah that I mean that, that's there's nothing wrong. In my view, there's nothing wrong with money. I mean, right now, there's in our economy, you have to have money to exist. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) you know. Yeah, but uh, there's just, I don't know. In in some ways, in 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 our in our culture, we're fighting a losing battle. You know, advertising. You're overwhelmed with advertising everywhere you look, and what's advertising but telling you you're not as good as you could be right you know you, you would be happier if or you would you're just you're not worth as much as you would be if you had this thing this car or this phone or this, and this they, house you know there's all these delicious products that <laughs> from, uh, from iphones to just yeah. these amazing oh i thought we were talking and, food i was yeah. gonna get excited yeah no, yeah <laughs> or, or yes. even even the, the, the opportunity to get great vacations and we're exposed right. to all that through the internet and through yeah. advertising and, and it's there there are a lot of things that are put in front of you that that uh that it's easy to, to want them but, yeah uh, but it, it's and, and, and yeah. it's if you can if for people that don't get caught up in that rat race i guess um it life is a little bit easier and um i'd rather not uh work for things that I won't have time to enjoy and, yeah. and, uh, uh, and just the stress of, of all that. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a constant, it's a lesson you have to keep learning because right, right. <laughs> it's, a, I, I mean, 
I love guitar pedals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love guitars, you know. Like I'm the same way with motorcycles. Oh, yeah. So, you know, oh, yeah. I've yeah. seen some pictures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, every now and then, you know. But, uh, but at the same time, I exercise enough uh, self control right. and, and um, you know, just, I think, just not getting in over my head on, on right. any one thing. And, and, um, um, and it's funny, you, you, it, it is possible to, to adjust to uh, a certain limit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just set my limit below my income. There you go. <laughs> and, and I seem to be, it seems to work out. And I think more, more people, uh, at least uh, people I know are starting to, to more and more think that way. And, yeah. and um, I think that's a good sign for the world that, that there, there are people that are starting to see that the materialism doesn't really necessarily make you happy. And, right. Right. Um, yeah. There's that kind of minimalism movement. Sarah and I watched that documentary, The Minimalists, I think is what it's called. Have you seen that? I, I started watching it, and, and I didn't get to finish it, but it, I, uh, I like the idea of it. Those guys have a podcast, too. <laughs> everybody does, I, I guess. I think everybody does, yeah. I'll do your podcast next. <laughs> yeah, all right. I'll have to start it, but uh, I'm in. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, that seems like a healthy movement, that, that idea. You know, people can, can go too far in any direction, but... Um, most of that movement seems like a really potentially course correcting, you know, yeah. for, for at least for our culture. I, I don't know what it's like everywhere else, but boy, oh boy, we love stuff here <laughs> and it's bad for everybody and everything, it is. how much we love stuff. It, it, it is. It, the, the thing I like about the, the minimalist uh, movement or, or theory is it really makes you look at everything in your life and, and think about what's important. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can do that with the, the knickknacks and the furniture and the clothes in your house, you can also do that with uh, the way you spend your time. And, right. and you start to really pay attention to, to the things around you and how they affect your life. And, and is this really important? And, right. Um, to, just to be more mindful of that, uh, it's got to make for a better life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, thanks for being on. I think, sure. is there anything else you wanted to? Oh boy. I mean, Come, stuff coming up in the future <laughs> or, 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 sure. I mean, the, the big thing for me right now is the, is the EP. Um, that'll be, I don't have an official release date, but we're looking at probably right at the beginning of June. I will, I'll be, well, maybe, but I don't know when this will come out. So maybe it'll be announced then. But, um, that's, that's kind of, the only thing I can see right now is trying to get that, that thing out, yeah. you know, so, so that's my big thing, uh, early June, putting out this, this first EP and, uh, playing some shows with the band. So that'll, that'll nice. be exciting. Um, when I, uh, recorded Mr. Fancy Pants, uh, the podcast with them, their, uh, new album just came out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we ended the podcast with them announcing a song, and then we played. Do you have anything that that uh, that, that we can tack on to the end of this? That sure. We can announce and can yeah, maybe intro it as a way of uh, kind of taking us out. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I believe I believe the f I'm going to release a sort of a single first online. So I mean, I could uh, when that's done, I can get it to you, and you okay. can put it on here. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and that that will be. Uh, a song called Drift, which will be the first single, for lack of a better word, from, from the EP. The EP is going to be called Promise Land, um, which is the title of another track on there. But the first single will be Drift. And yeah, I'll get that to you. Great. Thanks. Sure. So uh, thanks for being on the podcast. And, Absolutely. Um, thank you for me. listening in. And, and we had a great conversation. And hopefully you'll tune into the next podcast. And with that... Drift by Joshua Lee. Just when I think it can't get any worse, she proves me wrong. Not a hearse Honey, come on We used to see only 
the beauty marks And now they're gone Okay. 